Well, before I begin, uh, we received a message from our sister Ethel, who's in hospital at the moment. She was sent through a message through James this morning. Uh, as you, many of you know, she's been in there and had her surgery, and uh, recovery is taking a, l- a little bit of time. She's doing well, all things considered, but she has asked if we would just uh, keep our visiting until she gets home, which uh, we hope and expect might be next week. So she's asking us just to hold off. She's had a f- number of visitors, but she's also a little tired and needs a bit of recovery. So if we could uh, just respect that until she gets home, and then you can flood her with your presence. (laughs) Okay, Um, one other thing I want to mention this morning before I start, and and it deserves deserves mention. In fact, I, uh, I eavesdropped on the conversation I'd like to share with you. But don't worry, it's sanctified gossip, all right? Uh, There was a man sitting up front here this morning during the lesson study who mentioned something which I think is very profound. That today, him and his wife are married for 66 years. Move and joy, blessings to you. Did I get the number right? Right. Which uh, incidentally is about a third longer than I've actually been alive. So... So I think that's a, that's a profound blessing, you know, in a day and age such as ours, where uh, we make promises and break them so easily, uh, through thick and through thin, ups and downs, there's a couple worth emulating in terms of their marriage commitment. And uh, I, I just feel like I want to give the Lord thanks for that. So if you wouldn't mind just bowing your heads with me, we'll uh, thank the Lord for this kind of example. Heavenly Father, first of all, we remember Sister Ethel. We ask for your blessing upon her as she continues her journey of recovery. And uh, may that be speedy and may it be quick and may it be filled with your presence and with your comfort. And today we give you thanks because there is this, just this momentous length of time compared with our, our short lives on this earth that uh, Merv and Joy have been married. And we just want to give you thanks that you've brought them this far that through everything life has thrown at them, you've uh, made them faithful to yourself and faithful to one another. And we pray that in our church community that we would seek to emulate that kind of commitment and that we would have your spirit live in us and through us. So bless them in a special way, Lord, in the time that they have left together as a couple. May it be special, may uh, may it be filled with joy and celebration, and may every day be precious. And we thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, today we are looking at the third angel's message found in Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 and onwards, 9 to 11. And um, we have covered the first two angels, the previous Sabbaths, right? I've entitled this morning's Go Time. You will notice that each of the titles captures this element of time. The series is called Tick Tock because the three angels' messages highlight for us prophetically some of the events, some of the key ideas that we need to be looking out for in the last days. And if you haven't caught on to the message yet, what I'm suggesting to you is we're seeing those things fulfilled in our time and in our day. Now, if you happen to be with us today for the first time, you've never been to a Seventh-day Adventist church or you've had very little contact with us, I'm going to be moving fairly quickly. The third angel's message, each one kind of adds to the, to the one before it and gets more and more intense. And so we're coming to the climax here of the three angels' messages, and it's, it's filled with a lot. And I want to try and make it as relevant as possible by not just talking about the theology of it, which we will do plenty of, but, but to, to help you to track this message in our times today. And so we're going to be looking at both Scripture and things that are happening in our world. And we're going to talk about how these two come together. So if you happen to, uh, to, happen to feel like you're missing a piece of the puzzle... Uh, please know that I'm more than happy to chat with you in more detail after this. But I'm going to have to try and move a little bit quickly today. And so there's a few things I'm just going to outline on the screen without proving them to you in detail, if that makes sense to you. So, it is go time. The third angel's message, Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 to 11, reads as follows. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. 
He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Now, this is quite a, this is quite a disturbing message. The first angel's message was overwhelmingly positive. It was a positive call to repentance to remind us of the true God. Fear God. Give glory to him. For his, the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven the earth the sea and the springs of water. It reminded us of who God is and why worship is due to Him because He is creator and we are dependent creatures relying on His goodness and grace. We borrow life from Him and therefore He is intrinsically superior to us and the appropriate response is one of gratitude, of gratefulness, of humility of heart, recognizing that dependence, recognizing the kindness of God to us. And why would you be loyal to anyone other than that being? And so the first angel's message is this clarity call to remember our origins in creation. It reminded us and alluded to us that part of the creation story is that God rested on the seventh day. He blessed it. He sanctified us. And that every seventh day, instead of once a year celebrating your birthday as we typically do, Every week, every seventh day, we celebrate the birthday of the world. We celebrate the origin of humanity and we celebrate the goodness and the kindness of God. And that that's what the Sabbath is rooted in, in creation, before sin entered, before there was ever a Jew on the planet. Humanity was given the gift of the Sabbath for all enduring uh, generations and all uh, successive cultures and, 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 and different people groups. The second angel came along and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, for she makes all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And we unpacked that last week and we said that after the first angel calls us back to loyalty to the, to, to the true God, to the creator God, reminds us where we come from and, 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 and what we owe to him. The second angel comes along and says, be careful and uses this imagery of Babylon of old, the ancient city that was always the enemy of God's people, the captor of God's people. The one that spread uh, uh, misrepresentation and lies and counterfeit religion. That metaphor. Uh, the second angel comes along and says that, that at the same time you're being called back to loyalty to God, you must beware. Because not all religion in the world, not all spirituality in the world is true religion or true spirituality. Not all paths lead back to the true God. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. She's becoming corrupted. And we looked at some of the teachings. I mentioned them in passing that, that, that we would call Babylonian teaching by using the metaphor of Scripture. And then finally, the third angel comes along and says, If you haven't been paying attention, this is life and death. That in the last days, you're playing for keeps. God is calling you back to loyalty to the true God. There is counterfeit all around you. Pay attention. Wake up. Because this is life and death. And the issue here is relational. The issue here is loyalty. The issue here is worship. Who do you regard as supreme? Who is the authority in your life that you will follow at all costs? Who's, who, who will you obey and render allegiance to? That question will determine eternity for you. So now let's have a look closer here. The third angel says, Beware of worshipping the beast and his image. Now this is the part I'm going to move very quickly. In order to understand this part, you have to have studied Revelation chapter 13, which I don't have time to unpack with you today. And so I'm just going to tell you what we find there without actually proving it to you. There are two game plays in Revelation chapter 13 that bring on the final end time crisis before the Lord returns. The first one is called a sea beast. I stood on the sands of the sea and I saw a beast coming up out of the waters of the sea, right? And when you go through there, although these entities are not named because they're described in symbolic language, why did John do that? He conveyed truth in symbol because much of what he was saying was relevant at the time in which he was writing. And if the Roman Empire, the time when John is writing these things, were to understand the plain message he was bringing, not only would his writings and his materials have been confiscated and destroyed, but he would have been killed. 
And so God in his wisdom conveys biblical truth for the ages to come in sign and in symbol and gives us the keys in the rest of scripture to unlock those signs and symbols so that we can translate it into plain English. Does that make sense? This is the same way the allied forces um, conversed with one another uh, during World War II or the enemy forces during World War II, right? Before World War II had, could, be, could be won, they had to, the allied forces had to crack the enigma. The Enigma was a machine that the Germans were using to encode their messages, and you needed to understand and know how the Enigma worked to uncode the message. When the Allied forces cracked the Enigma, they could understand the German messages, and they were able to win the war. Same philosophy with prophecy in the Bible, Daniel and Revelation. God encodes truth in symbols, hands you the scriptures which contain the code or, or the, 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 um, the keys to unlock the code so that you can translate it. And when you go through Revelation 13, the sea beast is simply a political entity that arises after the empire of Rome, on the ruins of Rome if you like, a sp has a spiritual agenda, persecutes God's people and does so during a period when this power would be dominant for 1,260 years. So we're not talking about an individual. This is obvious an institution that lasts over time. 1,260 years. It seems to be killed, but is resurrected. The, the language of Revelation 13 is that it receives a mortal wound, but is healed of the mortal wound, and becomes internationally popular and influential. When you take all of those things together, the length of time, when it arises, etc., etc., you come to the conclusion that the only thing that the sea beast of Revelation 13 can possibly fit is the Roman Catholic institution. Again, emphasizing, not the people. These are not the members of the church. This is the institution with its teachings and its traditions and its inertia towards change, its unwillingness to reform. We had this major thing in history called the Reformation where those who were loyal to this church realized that it wasn't teaching and practicing biblical truth and sought to change it, reform it, but it refused. In 1798, at the height of its power, as a result of the French Revolution and the denial of God and the loss of, of respect for, for uh, the Catholic Church and Catholic religion, eventually the papacy is taken into captivity, the Pope dies in captivity, there's no more visible head. It seems like the church is in ruins. But two years later, this institution begins its rebuilding. A new Pope is on the throne and has been building ever since. There's another play in Revelation chapter 13. It's called the Earth Beast or the Lamb-like Beast. Also a political entity. When you look at the coding of Revelation chapter 13, you realize that it arises around about the time of the mortal wound that is received by the sea beast. So you're looking at around about the time 1798. It comes up out of the earth instead of out of the sea. The sea in Scripture in uh, Revelation 17 verse 15 is, is represented of peoples, multitudes, and nations. The earth juxtapositioned with that, sparsely populated. This would be a new nation, not arising out of Catholic Europe. Somewhere else on the globe, a new political superpower would arise. It would become a world leader. It would be closely allied with Roman Catholicism later in its experience, but it would start off as the bastion of religious freedom. It would speak like a lamb. It would have lamb-like qualities. And Jesus, though he taught the truth, though he was convicted of the truth, never once in all of his life coerced anyone to follow him. He believed in the freedom of conscience. He believed in religious freedom. And when you take all of these puzzle pieces together, there's only one entity throughout history that fits the description of the earth beast or the lamb-like beast, and that is Protestant America. The United States of America was founded by those fleeing Catholic Europe and the persecution of Catholic Europe as well as Anglican uh, England, right? Right? And the Anglican Church was seen by those who came to the United States of America as nothing more than a poorly reformed Roman Catholic Church. So those two were kind of more or less seen as the same, although the Anglican Church technically is regarded as a Protestant church because it broke away from the Roman Catholic Church. The settlers came from those faraway lands to this place where they could be free, where there would be no king and where there would be no pope because they saw abuses by both of those. They formed a brand new type of government called republicanism, not to be confused with the Republican Party, but republicanism, the idea that a government would be formed of the people, by the people, for the people, representative 
of those people, taken from those people. And they said that in this land, Catholicism would not have right of passage. In fact, anti-Catholicism was the most deeply ingrained bias held by the early founding fathers of the United States because of their history coming from faraway lands like Europe. In fact, it was so ingrained that if you were a Roman Catholic in many of the states, you were forbidden, you were automatically excluded only on the basis of your faith from holding political office because they had seen the connection between Roman Catholicism and politics in Europe. And they said, we cannot allow that to happen here. Now think of this today. It has gone from a Catholic, from from a very anti-Catholic country in the 1960s to electing a Catholic president. And since then, under the Bush administration, Obama administration, etc., ever increasingly close ties with Catholicism have grown into place. And that's what Revelation 13 says. It would begin looking like, it would be a lamb-like beast, but later on it would speak as a dragon. In fact, Revelation 13 says it would erect an image to the beast. Now, an image is something that reflects, reminds you of, looks like, commemorates whatever the reality was that it points to. Does that make sense? If you have an image of Nelson Mandela, you are reminding the world that this was a great man, is worthy of remembering. Well, the language of Revelation 13 is that this Protestant America, starting off so well, would grow and grow and grow, become an influential worldwide leader, but then would use its power to erect an image to the beast, starting as a land of freedom, the bastion of religious freedom, yet to come, but we can see the movement happening in our time, there will come a time when Protestant America would so align with Roman Catholicism that it will use its political power and international influence to set up an image To the beast. What is the image? Well, what did the beast do? The beast pursued an agenda of religious coercion and persecution. We're headed back to a time such as that. The third angel's message comes along and says, Beware, the major world players on the scene in our day and age will eventually form an alliance already beginning to happen, yet to come to its fullest fruition, that will result in a final age of persecution on religious grounds. And today we live in the time of freedom. Today we live in an age when you think, how could that possibly ever come about? It comes about slowly over time. And yet, having said that, I think you would agree with me that since the very memorable event of 2001, the world has become a rapidly changing different place. Citizenry is willingly handing over their freedoms in exchange for security. There is a rapid movement apace, all in the name of protection and security, that ultimately the payoff to that is the loss of personal freedoms. We are already in that time moving towards this. But the third angel's message says that these two game players would do something. They would require a sign of allegiance. It's called a mark on the forehead or on the hand. And that idea is taken from the book of Deuteronomy, where God told his people to keep the Ten Commandment law on their hand and on their forehead. And it was symbolic of this idea that the Ten Commandment law is the very governing principle of the, of the government of God, the, the government of heaven. That that law would be the governing principles that would guide your behavior, that which you do with the strength of your hand, and would be the basis of your reasoning, your forehead. Later on in the book of Revelation, you read about a seal. A seal that is placed on the forehead and on the hand. And that seal is the name and the character of God implanted in those who have submitted to Him. They have become transformed, renewed in His image. So when you combine this imagery, you realize that in the book of Revelation, there is a competition that is developing. There is a final crisis that's coming to this world, uh, this, the scene of this world. And that crisis is going to be about who you are fundamentally loyal to. So, here we can put it like this. We can compare these two. The mark of the beast on the one hand in in the third angel's message, compared with the seal of God at the beginning of Revelation chapter 14, also found in Revelation chapter 7. And both the mark of the beast and the seal of God are these four things. It's a sign of loyalty. It's a sign of submission, the one that you will render obedience to. And it is a symbol 
of worship. The one to whom you render obedience is your master. Does that make sense to you? That's a New Testament principle that Jesus talks about, right? To the, the one to whom you obey, that is the one you regard as the authority and the master of your life. The seal of God is exactly the same thing. The only difference between the two is that the one represents the, co- the, 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 the character and the government of God, the seal of God, and the mark of the beast is the alternative, the one that has set themselves up in opposition to God for the loyalty of mankind. And you and I are coming to a place in history where we'll no longer be able to ignore or just continue with our rather smooth and casual lives, but we're fast headed to a place where you will be compelled to make a decision. Now, having established from Revelation 13 very briefly that the mark of the beast or that the beast itself is Catholicism, it becomes very easy to discern what the mark of the beast is. If the mark, going back to the slide here, is a symbol of loyalty to the beast image, right? If it's a symbol of submission and obedience and worship to the beast, and you know that the beast is Roman Catholicism, pause there for a moment. How many of you have heard the very popular idea that the mark is a chip under the skin on your hand? Or a barcode on the forehead. Now listen to me carefully here. God is not interested in technological advancements. Do you understand what I'm getting at? I have no doubt that technology will be used to control the masses. Because it already is, right? They can track you on your phone. They can track you by your payments on your credit card. They can do all sorts of things. But the the use of technology in and of itself is not what determines whether you're loyal to God or not. Technology is just a neutral medium. It's neither here nor there. It's all about how you use it, right? So while I, I don't doubt that authorities can use technology to control, track the masses, etc., the, the, the mark itself is not about technology because the mark itself is about worship. The whole theme of Revelation 13, the whole theme of the, the three angels' messages in Revelation 14 is worship, 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 worship. Repent and come back to the true God. Worship. The hour of His judgment has come. Worship. worship. Beware, Beware of Babylon. Babylon. It's counterfeit worship. worship. Beware of the, 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 the beast and its image. It's it's about worship, worship, worship. Does that make sense to you? So what we're looking for here is, number one, to understand the beast. I think the reason people don't get their understanding of the mark of the beast correctly is because they fail to biblically identify accurately who the beast is. If you think the beast is who knows what, then you've got such a wide scope for what the mark might be. But if you understand the biblical metaphor, the symbolism, and you've unpacked it carefully in Revelation 13, and you know that the beast is a symbol for Roman Catholicism, then simply all you need to ask yourself is, what is it that represents Roman Catholic authority, Roman Catholic loyalty, submission to the Roman Catholic system that would bring you into worship in the context of Roman Catholicism, right? And you simply ask this entity, and they will tell you. They say, a letter from C.F. Thomas, Chancellor of Cardinal Gibbons, which was the top uh, cardinal in the United States, October 28, 1895, and he simply says, of course the Catholic Church uh, claims that the change of the Sabbath was her act. We're not trying to hide that. The Sabbath was always the seventh day of the week, Saturday. But we changed it to be the first day. Why do we have no problems admitting that? Because the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power, that ecclesiastical is church, right? It's a mark of her church spiritual power and authority in religious matters. We own it. We wear it as a badge of pride. Why? Because it is our symbol that we are almighty on earth. We can take the very commandments of God and alter them because we are the church of God and our voice is the voice of God. Louis Gaston Segur, another priest in France, said the following, The observance of Sunday by the Protestants, right? The Protestants who broke away from the Catholic Church and said, We can't be a part of you because you don't believe in the Bible and the Bible alone. You have all these traditions of man, including, you know, a variety of things. And so we're going to break away from you. We're going to go by ourselves and be the Protestant Church, the true church, the faithful church, the biblical church. This Catholic priest says, Now here's the thing. The observance of Sunday by the Protestants is an homage they pay, that's the language of worship, by the way, in spite of themselves to the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. Why? 
Because you have no basis to worship on Sunday, except that the Roman Catholic Church changed it to Sunday. So if you're worshiping on a Sunday, and you're, and you're neglecting the seventh day Sabbath of the Ten Commandments, the only basis you have, you cannot justify it from the Word of God. In fact, Catholicism published a book called Rome's Challenge. I've mentioned it to you before, but I'm encouraging you to look it up again. It's a short booklet, Rome's Challenge. It was, it was basically a Bible study on the Sabbath written by Catholic sources, written by priests and cardinals and bishops and whoever else. And the, this book, Rome's Challenge, proves definitively better than any Seventh-day Adventist could ever do that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord from Scripture. And you know why it's called Rome's Challenge? Because the Church of Rome wrote it to Sunday-keeping Protestants as a challenge to the idea that they were truly Protestant. They wrote it to Sunday-keeping Protestants to say to them, you say that you're Protestant and you believe in the Bible and the Bible alone, but here's the thing, you keep Sunday, and we will do a Bible study for you, and we will show you that nowhere in Scripture can you justify the change of the Sabbath, except if you accept Roman Catholic authority as the basis of your spiritual beliefs. Rome's challenge. Look it up and have a read of it. And so this is the point. The third angel's message comes along and says, Beware of the beast and its image, this Protestant America, who ultimately will form an alliance together and who will coerce, use their influence and their power, yet future, to bring about a state of things where you will have to choose loyalty to the system if you want to remain a part of the system. Because the end of Revelation 13 says that if you're not loyal to the system, the first attack or the first strategy of, of coercing your obedience will to be exclude you from the, to exclude you from the monetary system. We call, it, we call it financial sanctions. You will not be able to buy or sell unless you acknowledge the authority, the rulership, the spiritual uh, hierarchy of this, of this uh, alliance and of this institution. If you fail to do that, we'll just exclude you from the things of the world until you realize that to be a part of the family, you need to acknowledge the head of the family. And Revelation 13 goes on to say there will still be some who will be faithful and they will then face a death decree. I mean, it sounds like something out of a science fiction book, doesn't it? In this day of, of, of freedom and, and uh, do as you will. But it's coming. The mood is changing. If you're paying attention to world events, you will realize that the mood is changing. We're not there yet. You still have some time. But it's, hap it's coming. So, the mark of the beast, the sign of Roman Catholic authority. I want to suggest to you it's like this. Sunday sacredness in the context of a future legislative coercion resulting from an alliance between Roman Catholicism and American Protestantism. Now, why am I saying future? Because the context of Revelation 13 makes it clear that Sunday sacredness right now is not the mark of the beast. Sunday sacredness right now is simply a misunderstanding of Scripture. Sunday sacredness right now is not commanded in Scripture, and anyone who individually and personally wants to be faithful to the Lord needs to step out and leave that and come into Sabbath observance. The, 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 the issue right now is not being coerced. There is no legislation in place that forces you to choose. On top of that, this message has not gone to the whole world so that people do not understand the issues at stake and therefore cannot make an informed decision. When does Sunday become the mark of the beast? According to Revelation 13, in the context of this alliance, which uses its international power and authority to legislate and bring us to a place where we have to obey. And in that context, the discussion around it will make all people aware of what the choice is. And when people then knowingly and understandingly decide to go with that system, keep Sunday sacred in that context for the sake of being part of the world and fitting in and not suffering loss and not enduring hardship, then they will be marked as belonging to that system. But until that moment in time, Sunday is a commandment issue, which you must take very seriously, but it's not yet the mark of the beast. And here's the issue. What's the big deal about the days? The days are merely the external sign 
of an internal faith commitment. There are two different Sabbaths, Saturday and Sunday. Seventh day according to the fourth commandment and first day according to the legislation of Roman Catholicism. Right? That represents two different loyalties. Do you acknowledge God as the lawgiver, as supreme, as the one who gets the last say? Or do you acknowledge a man-made system of religion as supreme? Those two days represent two different gospels. The gospel of righteousness by faith. That is to say, I trust entirely in what he has done to save me and what Jesus has done. I trust in what he's, what he's done and I trust in his word and I will do whatever he says because he is God and so be it. And the other one says, we also like faith in Jesus. We don't like the idea of eternal death. So we'll offer you a way to enter into heaven. It, it, we'll also talk about faith in Jesus Christ and so on and so forth. But... But, but it's going to be faith in Jesus Christ on our terms. It's going to be faith in Jesus Christ, not on his terms and what he says, but we're going to, we're going to adapt it to, 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 to give an evidence of our personal authority in this world. And we're going to adapt it because it fits in with the world and the way of the world. And so you can believe in Jesus Christ and have the assurance of salvation, but you also get to do it your way. Two different gospels. It's like Cain and Abel in the book of Genesis. Cain was happy to acknowledge God. Cain was happy to pray to God. Cain was happy to offer to God a sacrifice. But he wasn't going to offer what he didn't have. That wasn't convenient. He, he, was a, he was a vegetable farmer. He was a good Seventh-day Adventist who believed in healthful living, right? He was, he, he, was a, he was a vegetable farmer. His brother Abel was a livestock farmer. Abel brought of his flock to the Lord and the Lord accepted it. Cain brought what he had thinking God would accept it. Surely it's, it's just the principle. It's not, let's not be pedantic about the particulars of what God says. It's just the principle of bringing the best of what you have. And so he brought the best of what he had. Vegetables to the Lord. And there was no blood in those vegetables. And the only way that sin can be forgiven is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so this, this offering... It denied the very principle of the gospel that Jesus Christ would die in our place. And it wasn't accepted by God. He was trying to worship. But God said, I can't accept it. And as a result, Cain, the one who was denied with the false gospel, persecuted and killed his brother. And that story is the story that weaves its way all the way through history and all the way through the scriptures, right down to the third angel's message and the time we're about to come up on in history. So two different Sabbaths, two different loyalties, and two different gospels. Now I want to spend a bit of time here quickly considering this idea of where we are in history. And, uh, and to do that, I'm going to look at Roman Catholic sources themselves, right? And I'm going to start with the positive. I'm going to start with something which, in all truth, we as Seventh-day Adventists would happily agree with. And if this was all there was to say on the matter, we could say amen to Roman Catholicism. So, the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, right, 1965, resulted in Pope Paul VI writing the following on religious freedom, right? Because that's what we're talking about. We're suggesting that we're coming up in a time when freedoms will be sacrificed and people will be coerced to go against the word of God in favor of a man-made system of religion. So how is that possible? What do they say about religious freedom? Now notice this. It's beautiful. It's perfect if this is all there was to say. It's so the Second Vatican Council. The human person has a right to religious freedom. Amen? This right of the human person to religious freedom is to be recognized in constitutional law. Amen? Whereby society is governed and thus it is to become a civil right. We would wholeheartedly agree with that. Government would clearly transgress the limits set to its power were it to presume to command or inhibit Acts that are religious. Do we agree with that? Amen. It is one of the major tenets of Catholic doctrine that man's response to God in faith must be free. Do we agree with that? No one, therefore, is to be forced to embrace the Christian faith against his own will. Do we agree with that? Absolutely. In order that the relationships of peace and harmony be established and maintained within the whole of mankind, it is necessary that religious freedom be everywhere, 
everywhere provided with an effective constitutional guarantee and that respect be shown for the high duty and right of man freely to lead his religious life in society. Do we have a problem with that? That is beautiful. 100% in agreement with that. And yet, what built to those beautiful statements is an absolute denial. Historically, and what happens after that, which I'm about to show you. So, historically first, Catholicism and religious freedom. This is Pope Pius IX in 1869. So, it's about 100 years before that beautiful statement on religious freedom, right? And, and he put together a document called the Syllabus of Errors. It was a document that condemned popular, prevalent ideas that were circulating in society at the time. So the statement is the positive philosophy, but the document condemned these. So we condemn the following, and then he listed all the propositions. Does that make sense? And here it is. The proposition condemned that in the present day, it is no longer expedient that the Catholic religion should be held as the only religion of the state to the exclusion of all other forms of worship. Translation. We as a Catholic church believe that the state should favor Catholicism and that it should be regarded as the only state religion. And any ideas contrary to that, we anathetize them. Absolutely can't accept them. Here's another one. We condemn the idea that the church ought to be separated from the state and the state from the church. In other words, politics and religion should be mingled together. And the church should be a governing influence in how politics are conducted. Now let me just state this to you. You look at history, the Catholic lands of Europe during the Middle Ages, the Muslim lands today, even those that were Protestant lands like England not long ago... Any time you combine religion and politics, you always end up with persecution. It is a bad combination. I come from this country of South Africa, and our policies back there on apartheid, which, which appalled the world, was based on Protestant Christianity controlling politics and their misinterpretation of Scripture. You never combine politics and religion. Another proposition that was condemned by, by Pope Pius IX Hence, it has been wisely decided by law in some Catholic countries that persons coming to reside therein shall enjoy the public exercise of their own peculiar worship. In other words, he's saying, we cannot agree with the fact that if you come to reside in a, ch in a church state, a Catholic country, that you're allowed to continue to be whatever you were and worship as you were. No, 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 no. You come to us, you become Catholic. And then there's another one here. Every man is free to embrace and profess that religion which, guided by the light of reason, he shall consider is true. You know what they're saying? You don't have the right to think for yourself. You don't have the right to read Scripture for yourself and conform to, to your own ideas of Scripture, or any other religion for that matter. He's saying, no, 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 no. You, mankind must conform to our understanding and our teaching of spiritual things. And the church must enforce that. So that was what was before. That was the, <clears throat> the position of the Catholic Church before Vatican II Council. Then Vatican II Council came up with this beautiful statement on religious freedom. And then what about the popes after Vatican II Council? Well, here's the friendly face of Pope John Paul II. You remember him, right? The third longest serving pope in all of history, right? And he wrote the following in 1998 in his uh, papal encyclical, which is, in other words, a document of the highest uh, Roman Catholic authority, right? He says the following, Therefore also, in the particular circumstances of our own time, 1998, Christians will naturally, like of course, it's, it's obvious, right, that Christians will naturally strive to ensure that civil legislation respects their duty to keep Sunday holy. What's he saying? He's saying if you're a true Roman Catholic, you will do all in your power to ensure that the civil state passes laws that enact the freedom to worship on Sunday. Okay, well, during his time in 1993, this is a little before he made that statement, the Vatican under his command, as it were, uh, approved a new catechism. And in that catechism, they make the following. Now, what is a catechism? 
It's a book that conveys teaching. It's a, it's a book of catechesis. In other words, it's a book that, that passes on to the uninitiated the truths of what that organization stands for. So if you were going to become a Roman Catholic and you went to the local priest, he'd give you a book called a catechism. And you would need to read and study that in preparation for being accepted into the fellowship of the Roman Catholic Church, right? So this is their official teaching book. And they say the following in there. And it's online, by the way. The, the, this catechism is on the Vatican website. In spite of economic constraints, public authorities should ensure citizens a time intended for rest and divine worship. In respecting religious liberty and the common good of all, Christians should seek recognition of Sundays and the church's holy days as legal holidays. Now, what's, what's being said here? The, Va the, the Vatican, through the Catechism, is calling on all Roman Catholics to become politically active for the purpose of ensuring that Roman Catholic dogma is enshrined in civil legislation. Does that make sense? It's not just saying, hey, take Sunday off from your employer, make a private arrangement. It's saying civil legislation. So the very book of Catechism calls for a mobilization towards this legislation around Sunday keeping that we're saying the third angel's message warns will come through an unholy alliance in the future. Pope Benedict XVI, that was our previous pope in 2007, said this, Finally, it is particularly urgent nowadays to remember that the day of the Lord, speaking about Sunday, is also a day of rest from work. It is greatly to be hoped that this fact will also be recognized by civil society so that individuals can be permitted to refrain from work without being penalized. Then, in 2014, that's coming right up to our time, right? There was a synod of bishops. Now, the synod of bishops is a group of selected bishops that function as the direct advisors to the Pope. They put out a survey to all the top Catholic leadership across the world, including the Roman Curia, which helps govern the Vatican City State, uh, the, the, the independent um, Roman Catholic churches of the East, all the, all the high-ranking bishops and priests and so on. And in this, in this survey, they wanted to know how can we develop a ministry to families that would best pass on the values, family values of the Roman Catholic Church to the next generation? How can we be most effective at evangelizing families, right? And this was, amongst many other things, one of the directives that came through the Synod of Bishops to the current Pope, Pope Francis, saying this. Some responses in this document recommend preserving the special character of Sunday as the Lord's Day, even civilly where possible, and encouraging families to meet on this day, not only individually as a family, but collectively with other families. In other words, the advice from Roman Catholic leadership to the current Pope is that he pursues an agenda of Sunday legislation in society. That he does this to ensure that Sunday is free for corporate worship so that families can be evangelized and have the gospel shared with them and that the values can be passed on to the next generation. How are we going to make this happen? Amongst many other things, Pope, you need to make sure that you're using your influence with the civil state to, to, to keep Sunday available as a sacred day. And now, this year, in our own time, a little country that was formerly part of the Eastern Bloc, it was big news on 30th of January 2018 that Poland enacted a Sunday law. Now, it's going to be phased in over time, eventually by 2020 having full effect. It would limit uh, trading, and they're doing it all under humanitarian grounds, protecting the worker so the families can be uh, together, etc. Which, by the way, in principle, we've got no problem with that. The problem with this nice-looking humanitarian family gesture is who's driving it and the bigger religious agenda that stands behind it. In this day and age, you cannot stand up and say, we are the Roman Catholic Church, we, we have changed the Sabbath to Sunday, it's a sign of our authority in spiritual things, and we're commanding the world to follow us. In this day and age, we're not quite there where the wound has been fully healed and full influence again is in the hands of the papacy. So, what they've done is they've come up with a very, very friendly looking, 
if you go against this, you would obviously be against workers, right? If you disagreed with this, you would be obviously against family, right? If you disagreed with this, you'd be obviously against saving the planet, right? I mean, they, they've taken this, their religious agenda, they've translated it into a humanitarian secular agenda, agenda and are now pursuing through parliaments of the world this kind of thing. And the challenge with that is, right now, it's benign. But it has a religious agenda that becomes a big issue at the end. The challenge with it is that when you start legislating one day, it means that the other day, called the seventh day Sabbath, becomes very, very difficult to honor. Because while you're legislating synchronized free time on a Sunday, and that sounds fine and good and dandy, it means that if employers are constrained to give you off on Sunday, it's going to make it that much harder for them to give you off on Saturday. Or any other day of the week, if you're a Muslim, that might be Friday. Does that make sense to you? And that's the underlying. So when you look at it at face value, it seems like that's great. We, we, we could do with some more public holidays in this country, if you're an employer, employee. Not if you're an employee, employer, though, right? Yeah, we, we, we would all love more public holidays. So what's the problem with this, Adrian? The problem is not what's happening now so much as what this leads up to. Historically, what has happened in the past, during the time of Constantine, Constantine passed a secular Sunday law. And it wasn't until a few years later that the church then came in and built on that secular Sunday law with an actual spiritual church dogma that said, if you worship on Sabbath and you do what they call Judaizing, in other words, they, they, they considered the seventh day Sabbath not as a biblical Sabbath, but as this Jewish Sabbath. If you join with the Jews in keeping their seventh day Sabbath, then you are anathema. You are cut off from Christ. So, they, so, they, so Constantine starts with a secular law, which is great. You give everyone synchronized time off. That's awesome for the family and for the worker and for everybody else. And then a few years later, the church came in and revealed its true colors, which was that this has a spiritual agenda, and if you don't go along with the spiritual agenda, then you are spiritually cut off. And that's the problem. Now, here's why I find this Poland issue interesting. Poland's just a little country in the Eastern Bloc. It's not part of what Revelation says will be the actual alliance you're looking for between Catholicism and the Protestant United States of America. This is not the final push because the rubric of Revelation is very clear about the players that are involved in the final situation. You might consider this a test case. But the reason I find Poland as insignificant as a country it is, no offense to the Polish, is simply this, that the movement towards the Sunday law was begun by the Solidarity Trade Union. That's why it's all about the worker. Does that make sense to you? Trade unions in the last days are going to play a big, big, big part in this whole thing. Because it's all about the worker and the family. Does that make sense? Now, the Solidarity Trade Union, did you know that in the years when it was underground because of communism, was funded significantly by secret accounts at the Vatican? Not only that, but the leader of the Solidarity Movement, Lech Walesa, was close friends with John Paul II. In fact, he credits the success of Solidarity with the support that John Paul II lent to him personally and to the movement. So you have a bond of friendship there, an actual alliance there, and funding from the Catholic Church, including, by the way, this is a very interesting case, because in addition to the Vatican, the United States, I think it was under Ronald Reagan, if I'm not mistaken, was partnering with the Vatican to bring communism down in Poland, and they together funded, and covertly undermined communism through the solidarity movement till eventually they toppled the government and took over and now it is payback. And payback to your Catholic alliance looks like this. On top of that, solidarity is a member of the ESA, the European Sunday Alliance. Very easy to track this. You just go to the ESA website, look at their list of members, and you'll find the Solidarity Trade Movement listed there as one of their movements. And what is the, the European Sunday Alliance? I've mentioned it to you before. It is an alliance of civil organizations and churches, Protestant and Roman Catholic, government organizations that have one common goal, synchronized Sunday time off for the benefit of the family and hush-hush for worship purposes. Does that make sense to you? The third angel's message goes on to say the following. If you align yourself with the system, 
If you sell out your obedience and your loyalty to God. If you, if you, if you uh, depart from your highest obligation to God to, to fit in with society. To go along with it for peace and for safety and for all those other things. If you do that, you will drink of the wine of the wrath of God poured out into his cup of indignation full strength. Very, very strong language. And you know what? When I read that verse or that part of the verse, it takes me back to this verse. Right in the heart of the gospel, what Jesus did for you and I. Matthew 26 verse 9. It's in the garden of Gethsemane. And it says this of Jesus. He went a little farther, fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. The cup. Do you see the theme? The cup. What cup? The cup of the wrath of God. The cup of the indignation of God. The cup that the sinner will have to drink under the third angel's message if they fail in their loyalty and obligation and submission to God. That cup of indignation, that cup of judgment was already drunk by Jesus 2,000 years ago. It is the basis of the gospel. Jesus already experienced the curse of the third angel. Jesus took it upon himself. Why? Because that's the only way he could secure our freedom. The only way that he could deal with our sin problem. He drank the cup of the Father's indignation against sin. The sad reality is that those under the third angel's message who choose to give their loyalty to the other side and who have to drink their own cup of indignation, the sad reality is that Jesus 2,000 years ago before that already drank it for them. But by choosing allegiance to the other side, they forfeit what he has done. Because at the end of the day, if you're with God, all of his covenant blessings are for you. But you can't be not with God and take things as you pick and choose to benefit you. This is language that's designed, it sounds harsh, it sounds dramatic, it sounds, but you know what it is? It's designed to take the careful reader back to the gospel and remind you of why you are loyal to God. The first angel was all about creation. We worship him because he is worthy as the supreme being, the source of all life and all good things. The third angel says, we worship him. Don't forget in the midst of this end time conflict, trouble and persecution and chaos, don't forget the reason we're loyal to him is because he suffered for us, because he bled for us, because he died for us. And no greater love has a man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. While this sounds like language that is so harsh towards the sinner, you will drink the wine of the wrath of the, 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 you know, the cup of his indignation and so on and so forth. It's language which takes you right back to the heart of the gospel and says, in the midst of this warning, remember. Remember not just where you come from in creation, but remember the price that you were paid for. Remember that you were redeemed not by gold and silver and the things of this world, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Remember the gospel story. When you're wavering and when you're struggling and when you're fearful and when you're anxious and when you're worried about what the future holds, remember that he already drank the cup. He went there before you so that you would never have to go there. When they're threatening your life, when they want to exclude you from the community of the fi financial community and so on, don't worry about it. The one who has bled and the one who has died will redeem you and he will save you. He has not paid that infinite price to leave you to die at the hands of man. He's not paid that price to abandon you. If you choose loyalty to the system, you will forfeit the righteousness of Christ. That's the harsh reality. But the good reality is that Christ has done everything to win your loyalty and everything that needs to be done to redeem you. Because he already drank the third angel's curse. And then finally, the third angel says that as they drink of that cup of the Lord's indignation, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And again, that seems radical. <laughs> That the sins of a short lifetime or the sins of a final crisis would result in eternal, ongoing, forever and ever punishment in the presence of the Lamb and the holy angels. 
It seems radical. It seems too much. If you're a discerning person, you should be thinking to yourself, that, that, that's, that is a cruel and tyrannical God. I understand there needs to be justice. I can understand that there needs to be some kind of punishment. I mean, that's what we call out for when we see the crazy crimes that happen in our country. And we hear about the, these things on the news. And then we hear of judge, judges giving these, 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 silly little, these silly little sentences. And we're all like, what? Come on! None of us are crying out for grace in that moment. We're crying out for what? Justice. 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 So I can understand that there must be some, some recompense of justice for in the government of God, right? But, but seriously, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Again, the book of Revelation is symbol, right? Truth contained in symbol. So you and I need to read more of Scripture before we make an assumption about what it means. And when we go to the book of Jude, sorry, I've got the wrong reference there. Fortunately, you can't see it. Okay, so when you go to the book of Jude, one, there is only one chapter in Jude. I think it's around about verse 8. It says the following, that Sodom and Gomorrah, the old story in the Old Testament times, that Sodom and Gomorrah serve as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah are not still burning today. There is no place in the Middle East where you can go and see Sodom and Gomorrah still roasting out there in the desert, right? Sodom and Gomorrah are not on fire today. They are eternally destroyed. They were never rebuilt. There is nothing left of them. There is no remnant of them, right? And yet the Bible says in the time just after Christ that Sodom and Gomorrah are being burned with eternal fire. So what is that language saying? It's saying that this, this, this eternal nature of the fire is not the flames itself, but the consequences themselves. When God judges, the judgment is final. There's no coming back from it. There's no reconsideration of it. There's no reversing it. That judgment is full and final and forever. So when the third angel comes along and says that if you choose to be loyal to that system, you're going to burn forever. He's not saying you're going to burn forever. Because that would be a horrible picture of the character of God. What he's saying is that justice will be served. That justice will be full and final. It will be irrevocable and irreversible. And when that judgment has been served, it will be over. And think about it. That makes sense. Because if it's to be taken as literal wording... And it says that they're tormented forever and ever in the presence of the Lamb and the holy angels. Then that means Jesus gets to go nowhere throughout eternity except watch the wicked be punished. So it's not literal. It's symbolic, right? That the judgment of God is full and final. In Daniel chapter 6 verse 5, there's an interesting verse and it follows a story of Daniel. Daniel was a man above reproach, ethically pure. His comrades were jealous of him because he climbed the corporate ladder faster than any of them because the king knew that he could trust Daniel. And so his friends wanted to eradicate Daniel so that he could make way for their ascent to power and to riches. And so they studied him carefully and they followed him and they looked at the books that he audited and that he was in charge of and, and they investigated the judgments and they followed him around and met with the people and did whatever they could to find some technical reason or some very good reason that they could report him to the king and say to the king, this man is corrupt, get rid of him. They were doing it for selfish reasons. And then the Bible says this, these men, after all the investigation, said, we are not going to find a charge against Daniel unless we find it or unless we make it up against him concerning the law of his God. And these men turned to, to uh, uh, what should we say, legislate a religious practice that they knew would conflict with Daniel. And why did they do it? Because they wanted him to be in trouble with the state so that they could get rid of him using the power of the state. Uh, you know what I love about this story? I think it represents how you and I are supposed to live in this world. We are supposed to live as those who are above reproach. We are supposed to live as those who, if you want to get rid of us for your own selfish purpose, it needs to be not because of our stupidity and our failing and our sinfulness. It needs to be because you have to make it up to make it happen. It needs to be because you have to counterfeit something. It, means, it needs to be on the basis, you're going to have to find a fault in us on the basis of our religion. And our faithfulness to God. 
And that's exactly what the third angel of Revelation says will happen in the last days. You know what Daniel did? He stayed true to his God. He was thrown into the den of lions and his God delivered him out of the midst of persecution and trial. And that is the faithfulness of God that you and I will get to rely on in the last days. On November 4, 1979, there was an Iranian protest outside the U.S. Embassy in Iran. Some of you may have been around to remember that. It took a turn for the worse, and these peaceful protesters scaled the wall and the fences, and they stormed the embassy, and they took the U.S. personnel hostage. It turns out that it would become the longest hostage crisis in all of recorded history. 444 days, these U.S. personnel were held as captives and as hostages in their own embassy. Well, as the thing continued, there was a number of uh, there were six U.S. diplomats in another building on the same compound who managed to evade escape. Other groups were trying to get out, but they were caught on the streets and brought back to be with their colleagues. But these six U.S. diplomats were able to evade escape because they were in a separate building. They spent the next number of days going from personal residence to personal residence, constantly on the move, so that they couldn't be tracked and couldn't be couldn't be caught. Eventually, after about 10 days, I think it was, these diplomats found asylum in the Canadian embassy. Now, the Iranians didn't know that they had gone to the Canadians. And so the U.S. back home, the government started to hatch a plan as to how they could re rescue these six diplomats. And so they employed a, a CIA operative who was their specialist in, in uh, cover stories. And this man, Mr. Tony Mendez, came up with a story as to why these diplomats, who were not going to be diplomats in the story, were in Iran. Because they had to come. Why would anyone be traveling in, uh, to Iran during a time of revolution? And so they made up the story that they had already been there and that they were trying to leave because of the revolution, but that these six diplomats, who were not actually diplomats, that these six men were part of a film crew. And this film crew had been scouting out locations in Iran for a Hollywood production. And that's why they were there in the country of Iran, and now they needed to leave. But in order to set up the story and make it plausible, they had to set a number of things in place. And I've made a few notes here. I'm going to read this to you. Number one, the Canadians agreed to, pub, to, to, to print genuine Canadian passports uh, claiming that these six men were in fact citizens of Canada. So that was the first thing they had to do to pass the deception. The second thing is that the CIA produced forged Iranian entry visas which were stamped into these passports that demonstrated that they were there for legitimate purposes. Third, they went to the lengths of setting up a fake movie production company in California with a live person manning the phone in case the Iranian um, officers at the airport, what do you call them, immigration officers, decided to phone home to check whether there was such a company. They placed adverts for this upcoming film in the various Hollywood newspapers and uh, magazines. So again, it would look legitimate. They printed fake business cards. Then they, had, uh, they, then they staged an actual film party in one of the nightclubs in Los Angeles to, to uh, you know, announce the film. And then they employed a makeup specialist who using makeup, change of wardrobe, changed the appearance of the diplomats in Iran. And in order for that part to happen, Tony Mendez, with an associate named as Julio, went to Iran, got together with the six, and then the eight of them traveled to the airport as if they were the film crew. They got to the, film, to, to, to the airport there in Tehran, the capital of Iran, and without even thinking twice, this cover story completely fooled the Iranian immigration police. They passed out through the airport, jumped on a Swiss air plan, plane, and took off to Zurich. And the Iranians were no the wiser that they had been fooled by this elaborate lie. You know what? The third angel's message is saying to you and me that that's exactly what happens in the last days. 
If you are not discerning and if you are not plugged into the word of God, if you are not paying attention to the word of God, it will be easy to be fooled by a counterfeit religious system that also claims to have faith in Jesus Christ, that also claims to be Christian, that also claims to be the very presence of Christ on earth, that make great claims. But the third angel not only warns you of this deception, but it gives you, as it were, the key to discern the difference between the true and the false. And that difference is that the false system of religion, while making all the right gestures and, and claims and quotes and all the rest of it, that false system will ultimately deny obedience to God and to His commandments. It will be a system that talks faith, that looks faith, that mentions Christ, that claims to be the very church of Christ. It will be a system that, that looks like the real thing, but the difference is in the fine print. And in the fine print it says, you will render obedience to us as the representatives of God instead of you will represent obe uh, present obedience to God in the form of the Ten Commandments. They will say, and the outward sign will be, very simply, a seemingly benign change of days. Instead of worshipping on Saturday, we'll take the day right next to it, Sunday. But in that very small, apparently benign change is represented a whole different gospel, a whole different loyalty. And so that the day on the outside becomes a sign of a different faith commitment on the inside. A commitment not with absolute loyalty to the God of heaven who created us and who redeemed us by his blood, but a, a, a form of religion that says, I like you, Lord, I want to serve you, but along with the convenience of the way the world works. I want to fit in with the systems around me. I, want, I don't want to make waves. I don't want to swim against the current. I'm happy to accept you. I love you, Lord, but it'll be on my terms not on your terms. You see, that is what the difference in days represents. And that is what the third angel is saying to us. Beware of the beast and his image, the mark of his name. Beware of, of, of giving yourself in allegiance over to that which is not the genuine article of faith. It looks almost the same. It's a grand ruse designed to fool those who are not paying attention to the word of God. You can be religious, you can be spiritual, and you can have the world at the same time. What a deal. God says, no, you cannot serve two masters. You must make a choice. Obedience to Christ with his law, with his righteousness, faith in all that he has done demonstrated in obedience, or the other side. Because here's the point. You are saved by faith alone. But saving faith is never alone. You understand that? You are saved by faith alone. But saving faith is never alone. In other words, faith is the root. And obedience is the fruit. May God bless you as you consider the issues at stake. Let me pray with you. Father in heaven, as a people, we stand in the flow of time. We stand right here in a time of peace and prosperity, at a time when things are gradually changing so gently and so slowly that we might not even perceive the momentous changes that are taking place. And I just pray that you would open our eyes. Open our eyes to your word. Help us to understand the gift of salvation, to understand the call to obedience and repentance. Help us to understand how the gospel intersects with our time and that which is coming upon us. I want to ask for this body of believers, Lord, for each of us here, that you would produce in us faithfulness, commitment to you that cannot be swayed. And we pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing my favorite song.